Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Inside the Music Industry. It's me, Dr. Jennifer Otter Biggerdike, and this is going to be the fangirl edition because, as anyone that knows me can attest to, one of the reasons I moved to England is because I worship the band Blur. So the fact that Dave Roundtree from Blur is sitting in front of me, I'm having some heart palpitations. So thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. My so, question. my first question is always what the guest does. You do so many things. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Is that okay? Okay. But uh, well, first of all, I want to know, what was the first record you purchased with your own money? I think, and it was a long time ago, but I think it was a single by a artist called Lena Lovitch. It was in the 70s, and it was an early punk single, and uh, it was her hit. It was really good, sort of pop punk. But yeah, she was. She didn't go on to have a massive career. I know you were saying earlier that your parents were quite musical. Yes. What's the first time you remember really music being played in your house? Don't know. Don't know what the first time was. It. They were both musicians, and there was always musical things going on. But um, that said. It, we, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a house in which there was constantly music playing. Mm. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't constant music on in the background, and I I still don't really do music on in the background. I can't really. If there's music playing, I'm listening to the music. It's very hard to do anything else when music's happening. So I try and, uh, and I guess my parents must have been the same because there wasn't really you know if we were if music was something music was happening that's what we were doing. That's, you know, it's funny because I, um, my last book I wrote was called Why Vinyl Matters, and I interviewed a lot of people for it, and one of my first interviews was with Lars Ulrich, and he said exactly what you just said, and I realized, he said, you can't listen to a vinyl record when you're jogging, you can't listen to it in the car, and you think about it, music's become like this background thing so much. How important is it, do you think, to engage with music the way that you're talking about, like really concentrate on the music? Well, it's, I, I don't know whether it's important or not, but it, that's the, you know, you could argue that's a failing of mine, really, rather than anything else. I know some people can write, some people need something on in the background when they're writing or when they're working, but yeah, that's, a, that's a, I find that incredibly difficult, because, you know, music is utterly engaging for me, if it's on, I'm involved in it in a, in a deep way. But, uh, um, and yeah, God, music when you're jogging, it just sounds like a nightmare. So one of my favorite, well, I mean, there's so many things about Blur and your career in Blur that I've watched over the years. Do you remember when you wrote Dave on your face the same year that Prince wrote Slave? I do, yes. In fact, Graham wrote Dave on my face. And uh, he wrote it with an eyebrow pencil, but it was almost, uh, it was almost completely blunt. So it was so painful in writing it on. It just <laughs> gouged my face. So half of what you can see of the of the Dave is the kind of redness of the scar <laughs> that was going on. I'm surprised it wasn't bleeding. In fact, that would have been a better statement had it been bleeding. But yes, we were we were there. Prince was there. He was going around. He he'd fallen out with his rap company. Warner and, Brothers. Uh, he decided that he was their slave, so he kept on writing "slave" on his face. So he thought it'd be funny to write "Dave" on my face. And uh, apparently, somebody drew that to his attention, and he laughed. Oh, that's good. I've heard. <laughs> I, I love that, though. Um, when you guys went up to get an acceptance speech on day, I remember Alex James really <clears throat> passionately talked about why there are not schools for popular music, the kind that you guys make. How important do you think a music education is, like something at Bib? Well, it's, it's something we didn't have. I mean, so it's, a, it's quite a luxury, really. Um, because unless you do something full time, it's hard to make that much progress in it. It's hard to hold down a day job and make much progress with your songwriting and your instrument skills in the evenings and the weekends. So uh, yeah, it, it is quite a luxury. I'm quite, but I'm a little bit jealous. But yeah, there was nothing. I mean, Alex saying that we, when we, it was you know we all wildly drunk as you can imagine. No. Um, at the Brits, and that's like the official way to be at the Brits. Maybe not now. I don't think they, no, still, don't the kids drink anymore. I think they they do other. They do other. Uh, yeah, maybe they do. They do. But uh, they were. We were. We'd run out of things to say, really. So uh, anyway, Alex had his bee in his bonnet about the fact that you could only get a classical music education going to university, and he thought that was outrageous, given that it was it was pop music in which 
Britain had been conquering the world, you know. We hadn't written good classical music for 50 years. But uh, not that I think that's true, but uh, anyway, the, certainly the, the, him saying that, he said, why, why, why can't you go to university and learn this effectively in a sort of drunken, rambling way? And I think other people have been thinking similar things because uh, fairly shortly after that, there was, the idea was muted, mooted for the, for the Brit school and how that might be funded through the Brits. And, uh, and that really led to uh, a number of similar schools being set up across the UK. And it's crazy because in other countries in the world, that was already a thing, you know, like in New York... That, that school was so famous that that, that that whole series fame was written about it wasn't yeah. it you know it was it was perfectly there was no kind of genre snobbery going on there it was a re recognized that you needed pop musicians jazz musicians all kinds of session musicians as well as the relatively small number of uh, classical musicians that you actually need so um, but anyway the, we're in quite a good place now I think with all of this I, I was at the Birmingham bin yesterday met all the people there and they're as fired up about music education as they are here in Brighton. So um, I didn't know anything about either of these schools. You know, I'd never visited them, I didn't know what went on here. And I'm happy to see that there are courses in things like music journalism, which I, I didn't know. And I'm happy to see that the course is being taught by people that know something about something. Mm, actually, done Because it. I've, I've uh, seen some other courses being you know, like in the uh, music industry, at other places that shan't be named, we go, who are you? I've never heard of you in the music industry. Anyway, that's not the case here, right? You know, it turns out some people I know <laughs> haven't seen for a few years work here, so that's quite nice. One of the things that you, you spoke about earlier is when you guys were touring around America, how, it, in a way, it kind of like you really use your Englishness as part of your whole shtick, and you really can see that definitely in some of the early videos. How do you think, or do you think that that was a patriotic thing towards being English, or do you think that that was more almost like a marketing ploy? Um, neither, really. I don't say I'm particularly patriotic. I'm, I'm far more European than I am British, I think. Uh, I've always felt that. Um, and it wasn't really, if it, it wasn't a particularly good marketing ploy because when we decided that was what the direction we were going to head in, that was wildly unfashionable. At the time we started doing that, the the charts were it was grunge was the thing, and the English charts were full of bad imitations of American uh, American rock acts, you know, They're all spawned by Nirvana, which were writing pop songs in the rock genre. People in England didn't understand that at all. We were writing these grotty rock tunes that uh, had no chorus, you know, and it was just, it was quite a depressing time for the British charts, really. How, how is anybody buying your records? But, uh, um, so we decided, having come back from America and, and realised several things. One, that you have to leave your country to see to get some perspective on it, to see what you like and dislike. And you know, we realised that we liked a lot of things about living here. We also hated a lot of things about living here. And that's kind of, um, that sort of love-hate relationship kind of spurred the, spurred the musical and, and lyrical influences, I think, from, from the beginning of our career. We kind of gave, gave that up after a while. That was the beginning of the journey. Once we were off on the journey, we stopped writing songs about uh, Englishness in England. And then, so it, weird, by the time that people started calling us Britpop and saying we were part of some kind of scene with loads of other bands, and it was all about Englishness, well, we'd kind of stopped doing that by that point, so uh, we didn't feel that really applied to us. And actually, it's interesting when you look back at the time, we were never included in those lists of bands. It's kind of retrospectively we've been added to that list. Mm. But at the time, we kind of moved on. We were we were back thinking about American avant-garde bands like Pavement and people who were doing something different again. That's kind of where our heads were at. Nice kind of park life that I really <coughs> get that from. And when you were talking about earlier, there was nobody at the tours. I'm like, I was there. <laughs> I was the nerd in the front. 
Yes. Um, that was me. <laughs> well, you were in San Francisco, so that was different. And San, Fran- San Francisco is the place where English bands go to feel that like they're yeah. successful in America. And, you know, New York and L.A., there's, there's a, a big uh, Anglophile audience that were followed our every move, so that was fine. But, you know, you can't do that for two years. And we were stuck yeah. over there touring in these tiny towns where people had never even met an English person before, you know, let alone... You had heard of Blur, you know, we were you. playing our kind of English pop, you know, we're from England, we're playing English pop. But, but what's interesting though, <laughs> you're saying that about San Francisco, and I was saying this to John Stewart, is the idea, this is before the internet, the idea from the videos, when you look, that was what we thought Englishness, true Englishness was. And I remember dressing to go to, my ex-boyfriend had a, a night which was all English, Anglophile music, we would dress English. Which is so, I sound like an asshole <laughs> saying that. That meant I had frosty white eyeshadow and like wore, you know, polyester vintage clothes because that's what we thought Englishness was all about, <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it's, you know, for you to say that, I'm like, I feel like I'm more kind of dorky about that. I, but, I think you were, I think you remember there was a, a phase in, the, in English music where people were looking to us to, bizarrely, I mean, can you imagine looking at me now, looking to us to be style icons, you know. Luckily, we had somebody in the band in Graham who was genuinely interested in clothes and still is. That's one of his obsessions, is clothes, you know, and to the point where he has large plastic boxes full of glasses, you know, and he can pick Does some he? interesting glasses for, this, what, for what he feels like really? today. Very passionate about all of that and was able to kind of steer us in the right direction because... Look at me. I mean, for the listeners of this podcast, I've got some jeans, I've got a Fred Perry, I've got a blue... I can't believe I've been wearing blue clothes for 30 years. Blue trainers, blue those, jeans. Those blue trainers top, are nice. Blue, a blue jacket, blue you look, eyes. You sound like a smurf when you're describing <laughs> yourself, <laughs> Okay, one, one, last, one last heavily tread question. The Blur versus Oasis. I just have to ask. <clears throat> yeah. Did you guys like go behind the scenes and laugh about it? And you guys being like Oasis and Blur, were you like, oh my gosh? Because to us in America, that seemed like a real thing. Even to this day, at 46 years old, I will get in almost fisticuffs with people. I'm like, <laughs> I'm Team Blur. And they're like, Oasis. So was the whole thing just silly and made up? Uh, it was definitely made up. Yeah, but the uh, there was, um, at the time, it's really as true now, but we always felt like we needed somebody to kick against. That is kind of the way the British music industry worked in those days anyway. Everybody had to everybody had to have a nemesis. It was kind of like WWF wrestling, you know what I mean? It's like everything was to do with the soap opera of uh, you nicked somebody else's girlfriend and blah, blah, blah. Because actually there's not that much to write about with in music, you know what I mean? That you know, music happens quite slowly. Yeah, yeah. And there were three tabloid music magazines to fill, music newspapers to fill every week, and then a, a large selection of monthly magazines. There wasn't enough music being made to write about, so it was all about the stupid soap opera of, uh, of you know, who's out of what club, and, and he said this, and the blah, 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 blah. So... Uh, that having somebody to kick against was kind of almost the national pastime for bands at that time. So we had had various bands that we were rude about and that were in turn rude about us. Um, and uh, but by and large, we were a bit too English to take that too far. But in Oasis, we met our match. They were just <laughs> as interested in slagging us off and far more creative in their slagging off of us that we could possibly be with them. So um, it occurred to us that we both had, we were both releasing singles in the same month. And uh, so we thought, right, we'll put our, our release date on the same days as theirs, and then we'll see. It'll be a record sale off. You know, like, it's almost as embarrassing to talk about it now as having a kind of dance off in a car park, might be. <laughs> And uh, so, anyway, we, we moved our release date to coincide with theirs. They uh, then moved theirs out of the way, which we talk, took as red rag to a bull. So we moved ours again to sit on top of theirs. And uh, it actually, it was a, we should have won an award for that because it actually was a great marketing ploy. It, it, for both of our, for both of our uh, bands, it pushed us up to the next level, you know, up to the the bottom of the top ladder um, in the music industry. Um, 
So it, that was great, and you know, it was on that the 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 ch on chart day. It was on the national news on every channel. It was on the front pages of the papers. They were wheeling in commentators who knew nothing about pop music to talk about <laughs> the social relevance of it all. Every kind of conceit there is in England and Britain, they managed to kind of tie into this. It was North versus South. It's middle class versus the working class. You know, um, uh, it was the 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 downside of all of that was that we weren't bands that musically had much in common really they were doing something very different to what we were doing and uh, it stapled us together at the hip ever since so now People Blur, ask about that Blur and Oasis you'd almost think we were a band called mm -hmm. Blur and Oasis you know um, so that after after both being given, catapulted up into kind of uh, national and even international fame as a result of that it did make it did get a bit galling for a few years after that when that's pretty much all we were asked about, you know, this thing with the races. Um, but I'm kind of a bit more relaxed about it. I've got a bit more perspective on, on it now. But personally, I never had anything against them because I was married to a woman who works at their record company, so I knew it quite well, you know. Noel's wife used to pop round. I always got on fine with Noel, I really, really like. He's a lovely, lovely guy and uh, so. Uh, passionate and creative he's got a beautiful voice Liam is a, a slightly damaged soul but I've, I've always got on fine with him you know I was a bit of a laugh with Liam but uh, all of those things we should have won some kind of marketing war for us it was a good idea and uh, you know at the time people were saying well not since not since uh, the Beatles and the Rolling yes, Stones yes. Had, but the reality was actually the Beatles and the Rolling Stones never did that they always separated their release dates quite deliberately, you know, so actually nobody else had come up with that idea. Nobody else, by uh, accident and design, managed to capitalise on it quite so well. So, kind of changing gears a little bit here, yeah. when did you first know that you wanted to be in a band and you wanted to be in a group that was successful? What was, did you, was it like a revelation you had or what was that process? No, I, I have a, a, always made music but uh, my original plan was to be an orchestral musician and I went to music school, studied to be an orchestral percussionist. Um, bagpipes? that was my first love, really. Everyone's bagpipes. Well, no, I never that. loved the bagpipes, really. Yeah. <laughs> that was a way to piss my parents off. But, uh, um, so I, I, and I, I loved then and I still love now being in a huge musical ensemble. The orchestra is far and away the best of those and being the drummer in the orchestra Basically means you're you're attending an orchestral concert and you don't have to pay. You know, <laughs> you can occasionally you have to go bong yeah. on the timpani, but really, you're there, you're a spectator and uh, but you're right in the heart of things and it's such a lovely thing to do. But it's not. I don't think as a percussionist it's very satisfying. If you want to be an orchestra, you really want to be playing the violin if you want to have a satisfying musical career. So it wasn't. Uh, I don't think I would have been happy doing that. And anyway, when I got to kind of, you know, teenage years and discovered girls and discovered the power of pop music to uh, make a gangly boy suddenly a bit more attractive, I, uh, I completely changed my mind. But yes, part orchestral music and jazz, Still, I still love good jazz and hate bad jazz as much as I ever did. Um, but uh, I wasn't as interested in the kind of uh, technical ability you had to have to play jazz. Yeah. I wasn't that interested in drums per se to kind of get that skilled. I was always far more interested in making music than I was in playing the drums and still okay. am. So, um, but yes, when Alex joined, suddenly things were much, much better immediately from rehearsal one when Alex was there. He turned up with lots of ideas, lots of kind of passion for things and um, and uh, lots of booze, as I remember as well, which always goes down well. <laughs> and uh, that was that was the, probably was having finding the right people in the band was the fundamental thing that made it all work. But uh, the main the main um, thing that sustained the band all of this time, the two things really. First of all, the fact that Damon is an obsessive songwriter and spends all his time doing it and always has hundreds of unused 
ideas for songs lying around, so every project he does, including Blur, he turns up with a huge number of, uh, of things we can try. And, uh, and uh, second is that we're, we're really good live. So no matter how we're, many, we're amazing live. How many yeah. crazy, stupid things. We haven't always made good records. We've made some real, real uh, stonkers. But uh, stinkers, rather. But uh, the, and we've made some pretty poor career choices. We, we took one career choice that pretty much forever meant we were never going to be successful in America. We pissed off somebody we really shouldn't have pissed off. Um, and that was that. So as a result, we never really broke America outside the big cities. But the, all of that, whatever, however crazy we got and however stupidly we, we behaved, we could always just turn up on stage and just do it live. And our live shows were always really good. And everyone would go, idiots, blur, there'd never be anything. And then they would see us live and they'd go, ah, okay, yeah, now I get it. All right, well, we forgive them all that nonsense then because they can just perform. I mean, having seen you many times, I can absolutely attest you're incredible, incredible live. And last time I saw you was at the Great American Music Hall, actually, in San Francisco, on the, the Think Tank tour. That was, that was great. Do you think with, with, with Damon, it is a compulsion to write, or does he feel like he has, he has to, like as an artist, be writing, do you think? Or is he more like wanting to make sure he comes to the next meeting with material? Or is it a combination of both, do you think? That's his thing, really. I mean, I think fundamentally he is a songwriter. He's a songwriter that performs and and uh, does other things. But fundamentally, that's his thing. He's a songwriter. So that's what he spends his time doing. I want to talk about you now. So you're active in politics. And when you and I were growing up, music and politics were really, really linked. Do you think music and musicians can still be powerful and impactful with social change and engagement? Don't know, and I don't know if actually they ever were. I'm not sure if all of that wasn't rather overblown from the 60s onwards. Music's been quite good at reflecting social change, whether it's actually had a driving effect on it. Well, that's, that's a kind of controversial thing to say, and I think many musicians would be rather offended by that idea. Many musicians think they are the engine of social change, but I'm not so sure. And I have to say, once a month I get an email saying I'm doing a panel on how music changed the world. Will you speak really? on it? Yeah, <laughs> because there's still this per pervasive idea, you know, people write PhDs on it. And I'm not so you're sure. Look, you're looking at me when you're saying that. I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write your PhD on it? No, my PhD was on um, Joy Division and Nirvana and the idea of authenticity and image and how we sometimes rewrite history. Yep. Do you like well, that? I'd, yep, I would certainly I would be interested. That sounds like a dinner party discussion I would be a part of. I'll send do you know what? Don't threaten me with your times, I'll send you a copy of my yeah, book I'll be interested. Yeah. So what do you I wanna to talk to you about like what you do day to day. So yeah. as a counselor yeah. for the Labour Party, what do you do every day? What are your responsibilities? And, well, and why did you do that? Why did you decide to go down that, that street, if you would? Um, it's not it's not a full time job. It's uh, it's uh, especially as I'm a Labour councillor in an overwhelmingly conservative council, Norfolk County Council. Where I'm part of a very small Labour group in amongst a huge sea of conservative councillors. So I get I don't have any actual power to do anything other than cause trouble in the <laughs> council. I don't run the department. I don't. Uh, I don't have any authority there. So my the main focus of my work is that I try once or twice a week to go knock on doors in my Do constituency you? and try and see if there's any way I can help, try and uncover problems, pass them on to people, uh, relevant people, if it's something I can't help with, or try and help if it's something that I can. So do you, do you have, are you referred to people, or do you literally just like door knock and say, hi, I'm Dave? Yeah, I say, I'm your county councillor really? to see if there's any, any way we can be of help do they ever recognise you it's well known that I'm the county councillor there yeah so there's no problem and what, why has that been important for you to do um, it, it, all of that started as long as as well as my legal career as part of a 
I suppose kind of a midlife crisis, I guess. When I was, it, it, I, I spoke in the in the talk today about how there was this when I was very young. There was like I was desperate for something. I, I just, you know, I was unhappy, and I thought if only I could be a star. I would, that would be the missing part of me that would fulfil me and I, finally I could be happy and I became to some extent a star and uh, it didn't achieve that at all and I've spoken to a lot of other musicians who said similar things you know they came from broken homes or bad backgrounds and were just kind of fundamentally unhappy people and thought that if only they could achieve if only they could be on top of the pops if only they could be number one that would fulfill them you know that finally they could they could relax and that would uh, and uh, of course it doesn't do that at all <laughs> I don't know why I was stupid enough to think it did but anyway when it became clear that, that wasn't going to work does it look like anything <clears throat> isolates you more in a lot of ways no no I don't think so didn't, not with me anyway but uh, no, it it gave me it it gave me a circle of friends that uh, I've, to this day I've you know the people I was hanging around with in the early days of the success of the band are now running the music industry you know all of my mates are now the managing director of this and the head of that and it's like what the hell <laughs> we were just out getting drunk together weren't we well, how did you become the head of you know <laughs> yeah so it became. Uh, then I, that was a, that was quite a destabilising time, really, for me. For destabilising a couple of decades, really. When I thought, well, if that's not going to work, what the hell is going to work? Anyway, after a, a lot of uh, missteps and uh, and uh, rather ill-advised uh, ill-advised choices, I eventually it became clear to me that having some kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship with people was the thing I was missing in my life. Having and so I threw myself into several areas of life where I could sit down with a person and try and help them on a one-on-one -on -one thing. You don't get that in a band, you know. When you're in the studio, you're kind of locked away with a very small group of people and the music makes its way out to the world, but you don't see them. You don't, music, I think, personally believe music does make a big difference in people's lives. Uh, it certainly has in mine, but you don't see that happening. Yeah. Similarly on stage, you know, you walk on stage, but once you're successful, you walk on stage with thousands of people there, you know, and you burp and people cheer, you know. It doesn't seem it doesn't it doesn't seem like an appropriate response, all this screaming and shouting and kind of you know, I, it's great and I love it, but it's not it doesn't seem like you helping them in any kind of actual you know, you don't see the results of that. So anyway. Lot, I threw myself into several things I work in the Labour Party I've been a member for years but never done anything always kind of tutted up the way other people were doing things but never volunteered to anything myself so I just turned up one day and started volunteering similarly with law big chain of coincidences but the long and the short of it was I turned up to an East End law firm volunteered my services they said alright we'll sit down what can you do alright we'll sit down there and do it then and uh, that led to me Ended up to training as a solicitor and, uh, and representing clients. You know, I'm a criminal solicitor, so pretty unusual clients, people I wouldn't have normally uh, associated say. with. And I saw some pretty wild things, I've got to say. But uh, if you say that as a drummer, Blur is definitely saying something in terms yeah. of saying wild things. So is, you, is your day to day life kind of a mixture of all these things then? How much how much is music and being, and being a percussionist still part of what you do on a daily basis? Well, at the moment, my day to day life is film music. I, have, I write music for film and TV, so that's a pretty intense thing to do. I, when I'm working on a job, I generally get up fairly early and work through to lunch, then work all the way through to about 11 o'clock and crawl into bed because it takes so much time to do. So, and it's a difficult thing to do, um, but quite satisfying. So that's what I do day to day at the moment. Uh, I do, as I say, a couple of times a week I try and get out into the ward and knock on people's doors and see if there's anything I can do to help there. They have the council meetings, uh, two or three a month, a couple of hours each, so it's not too onerous. But these jobs are what you make of them, you know, there's enough, it's quite, it's a very poor area that I represent. If I was to, I could easily spend all day, every day, working on it, you know, and not run out of, uh, not run out of things to do. 
So I always feel slightly guilty I'm not doing enough. Equally, I'm doing a lot more than most people. So uh, I guess I'm probably in a happy medium situation. Has that helped fill the hole then that fame yeah. did not, that really has? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's why. That's why. If only somebody had told me, I wouldn't have listened to them. If only somebody had told me. <laughs> <laughs> Piece of advice for anyone wanting to pursue a similar life path to you. Uh, it's all about songs these days. It's all about songs, so you have to write songs constantly. That's the main reason we've ended up being as successful as we are, is that Damon constantly writes songs. So I've tried to do that in my career outside Blur as well, I write as many songs as I can. And that's they're the, pretty much the only thing that's worth any money in this new music industry is songs. Plenty of people, plenty of better drummers than me, probably be, plenty of better drummers than me in the room today. Know, technically better but uh, it's not how good you are if you're playing somebody else's music you're going to end up in a pub somewhere really yeah that's true so um, the only thing that's worthwhile is songwriting really you have to be able to play your instrument obviously if you can't play but uh, you know when you look at the the kind of technical standard of the musicians that are that uh, make it, they're not, you know, the ones that are number one aren't the best at playing the keyboards, you know, and never have been, you know, aren't the best drummers, not the best drummers that are in the top bands, it's the drummers playing the best songs, the ones with the, playing the most interesting, having the most interesting ideas, and that's certainly everything in, at the big push in my band and I think in all professional bands is to come up with something interesting not to come up with something complicated not to come up with something technically brilliant nobody cares it's to come up with something interesting have an interesting idea and the foundation of all of that is coming up with an interesting song one of my last questions I promise tell me about the featured artist coalition and why you decided to start it what is it what does it do it's a a, a loose coalition of uh, People in bands, basically people who are on the front of the the front of the uh, record, rather than listed on the back. Um, we still haven't come up with a particularly good definition of what a featured artist is. It's not a legal term, um, but uh, the the idea for it came about because it was at a time, probably about 10, 15 years ago, when there was. The change in the music industry was accelerating. Mm. I mean, it's always been a technological industry, a technology industry. It's always been driven by the technology. You know, and the reason a single is three and a half minutes is that's how much music you can fit onto a forty-five. No other reason, you know. And that's that drove the formatting of radio. So all of these things came about because of the technology. That, you know, and you can fit three and a half records on vinyl because that's the speed at which you spin it at in which uh, uh, the, the kind of noise to signal ratio is the best. Um, now that we don't use vinyl as much, the, the technology is shifting and the song lengths are shifting and, uh, you know, having a, that will happen at the same time as dance music and so having a five minute track is different, that forces radio and things have reformat themselves differently and blah, 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 blah. So it's, this has always been the, the case that this technological change drives music. The difference here was that the music industry was ganging up against technological change uh, which started around the time of MP3s and the music industry thought the world was going to end, the sky was going to fall in. So everybody was campaigning in the music industry against all this technological change and saying you've got to do it our way because we represent the artists. So what's good for us is good for the artists. So you must prioritise us in all this technological change. Nobody's actually speaking to the artists. And it, more than that, everybody was treating the artists in a very patronising way. So, well, of course, you can't be expected to understand this. You know, we grown-ups will do all this negotiation on your behalf, and then we'll tell you what we've decided. So we were all very annoyed about this, and uh, so a group of us, including musicians from Radiohead and Pink Floyd, Sandy Shaw from the from the Sandy Shaw experience, and loads of other people, um, got together and uh, said. We're not going to be left out of this. We are going to have a voice as well as everybody else. And so we threw ourselves into the middle of this swirling technology debate, and uh, that's kind of you know the, the 
pace of change in, in the industry driven by technology has only accelerated actually since then. But lots of other things have happened. There's been two big changes in copyright law driven through the EU. So then we had to find out how the EU worked and start lobbying MEPs and stuff like that. So we've all learned a lot about politics and the industry as a result of doing it. Equally, I talked in the, in the talk this afternoon about how I've made some big mistakes in my career, uh, not least signing to somebody who turned out not to be trustworthy. Modern giving, English, giving, I love, love that first yeah, word though. <laughs> giving him too much control, not checking what he was doing enough, and, uh, and uh, so we all, we, it turned out we'd all made stupid mistakes. So we resolved that where we could, we would pass on the benefit of our experience to the next generation so people didn't have to make these mistakes over and over. As people have been being ripped off since the 60s, we thought, well, perhaps ours can be the last generation where people are ripped off and we can explain to people how to stop that happening. So there's a big education push with the FAC as well. But the whole thing is artist to artist. So it's all run by, financed by, driven by musicians. We do hire a CEO to actually make sure that something's going on make sure the website's updated and, you know, things actually happen. But everything else is done by musicians, for musicians. And, uh, yeah, so there are three, three things we do, the, the lobbying side and the government relations and all of that, making sure the artist's voice is heard. The uh, educational side as well, and then uh, also trying to drive uh, people to work with other people so we try and put on events where people can meet other musicians can meet other musicians and spawn collaborations and uh, that kind of thing There's a lot of different ways that young artists can get involved then from what you're seeing right now Yep, you does not consider anything to join unless you actually want some benefits and then you have to pay but if you just want to be involved and be on the mailing list you can sign up um, and uh, there's uh, very very established musicians who are kind of central in pushing this forward, but there's also a lot of new up-and-coming artists that are involved as well. It's quite it's an interesting thing to do. If you're totally interested in how the music industry works, which you should be really, if you want to make a living in it, I'd say it's, been, it's, a, it's a good way of finding out. What are your future plans? Well, there are, well, another job, another film job starting in January. I've been promising people a solo album for about five years now. So Did I'm you actually, sing? I'm actually, you yeah, yeah. <gasps> so I'm actually really? going to have to deliver on that, deliver on those promises. So um, I'm trying to write some more material, and do some more co-writes, and do a bit of recording at the moment. Where do people find you on social media? Do you do you have your own? Uh, oh, well, I, t I use Twitter, but really, I I can't stand Facebook anymore. It used to be good once, but it's just horrendous now. Um, so. By and large, I'm on Twitter, it's at Dave Rowntree. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us. Today. Pleasure. It means a lot. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Inside the Music Industry. Remember to subscribe, give us five stars, and write about how fabulous you thought the podcast was. Take care. We'll see you next time.